Hello, Peter. Welcome to Spear Pillar. That's right, folks. I'm up here on top of the beautiful Mount Coronet, surrounded by beauty, by the way, trying to stop the sinister Team Galactic from enacting their evil plans. But I'm currently taking a quick break for some Pokédex research in between the fights, trying to make sure I stay with the curve on Pokédex completion, because this thing gets out of hand fast if you don't take the time to keep up with it. Okay. Yeah, this is a super interesting one, actually. I've heard that Munchlax is incredibly rare, but the Pokédex is saying area unknown entirely. Which is weird, because I'm still pretty sure you can find it somewhere, at least. I think the catch method is supposed to be really intricate or something. Who knows? It does have me pretty curious, though. This guy at the cafe on Route 210 had one and said it took him forever to get a hold of. So maybe if I could figure out the grind, I could go for it someday like him. But it might be a bit above my pay grade, though. I'll have to see about that. Okay, but that's enough Pokédexing for now, I'd say. Let's get right back into the action. Okay, two against one. Not super fair, but... Oh, hey, Barry. Thanks for coming out. Let's go to town on these chumps. Just you and me, striking a blow for justice against the worst criminals in the land. Okay, now wait just a minute. How do you have that? Where did you get that Pokémon? How does he have one? How does Barry have Munchlax? I thought this was supposed to be like the rarest Pokemon of all time, and it takes forever, and these guys are grinding it out for him, and this is the most impatient guy I've ever met, and yet here it is as his first Pokemon. But that settles it. If this guy of all people has one, then it's probably not actually that bad. And after I finish up up here, I'm gonna go find a Munchlax of my own, real easy, real soon. That was vaguely my line of thought in 2009, playing Pokemon Platinum for the first time. Completely unaware of the uphill battle I was soon to be in for. Because for some reason, Munchlax is unexpectedly the most difficult to find Pokemon in this generation by a mile. And it might even hold that distinction across the entire series. It has a one-of-a-kind, cosmic level difficulty to catch Wild in Gen 4. One that, without explanation, requires patience, luck and a deep understanding of the game's inner workings, all on a Pokemon that seemed to be receiving mascot status right up there with Pikachu. But how did we get here? To best fathom the incredible Munchlax, let's start from the beginning. Munchlax is an endearing little normal type, and has been a fan favorite since its official introduction to the series in Gen 4 as the pre-evolved form of Snorlax. Munchlax was uniquely positioned as a sort of promotional Pokemon for the generation, as it made multiple appearances in games and the anime before its technically official debut in Diamond and Pearl. It would see cameos in Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Red and Blue, Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness, Pokemon Dash, and even the absolutely legendary Pokemon Team Turbo CD-ROM game, which is a very real game that I did not make up. May catches one in the Gen 3 anime, and it's featured in the Deoxys movie. All of this being before its official release, where it could be caught and used like normal in the Gen 4 games. Which is to say, in a way, that all of these appearances were promotional, with at least a partial purpose in building hype for the future of Pokemon, where this incredible creature could be caught and placed on your team, just like everything else. And this positioning created an additional level to the identity of the Pokemon, something not quantifiable by official materials or data in the game's code. This new and sort of mysterious Pokemon is making these odd appearances. I want to know more about it. I want to discuss it with my friends. I'm going to draw conclusions based on the few context clues we get, because every appearance so far has been shown to us through this slightly tinted lens of being able to look, but not exactly touch. It was still shrouded in a bit of mystery. So at the eventual point of Diamond and Pearl actually releasing, fans had most likely seen this Pokemon before in some capacity because of the sheer volume of hint appearances it had had leading up to the release. And in that moment, they wanted it. Who wouldn't? It's cute, and kind of funny looking. I definitely want one. As a kid, I ran into Munchlax in Pokemon XD, and then again in Blue Rescue Team, and I was intrigued by the little guy. I wanted it. I wanted it bad. I bet you wanted it too. That's right, you specifically. And even you. The Pokemon Team Turbo superfan who was just jonesing to get your hands on a Munchlax of your own. And while I'd like to get more in depth with this idea later, 
We're already seeing here a component of this Pokemon's identity that revolves around what individuals and communities are feeling about it, rather than what has been said specifically by the game or official materials. A large piece of this Pokemon's identity revolves around rumors, discussion, and the mystique it invokes in a way that isn't written anywhere in the official documentation. But rather, it exists in the hearts of players, because the community has only been shown these curious glimpses of it. And so that was the state of affairs for Munchlax going into the official release of Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum. It's even the first Pokemon you're actually shown in-game. Professor Rowan throws one out during his introduction speech. Another peek at this Pokemon if you somehow hadn't seen it before. There were enough breadcrumbs, and then that tiny bit of mystique surrounding the Pokemon for the hunt to officially be on. And so here we are. It's not 2009 anymore, but I want to catch a Munchlax just as much now as I did then. I fear though, at least in these games, it's probably not happening for me. Because despite all the excitement and hype building up to it, grabbing a Munchlax straight out of the pocket in these games might be one of the most difficult and most time consuming Pokemon to catch in any game, past, present, or future. Not including timed events or things like mythicals in that calculation, as Munchlax is actually here and untimed, but actually finding one feels about as likely as winning the lottery. And why is that? I have no idea. What were they thinking? But let's at least try and make sense of it, and we'll start with getting into the on-paper mechanics that create this rarity, and then go from there. Munchlax can be found in the golden-colored honey trees that are scattered around the region of Sinnoh. Pretty early into the games, you'll arrive at the beautiful Floroma Town, where you'll be introduced to the honey tree mechanic after a brief spat with Team Galactic. And now we're able to buy jars of honey from the honey salesman in the meadow. It's also found all over the place too, and you'll definitely come across it naturally over your journey at other places. It's not a hard item to come by. Once you've got some honey, you just slather it on a tree, and then you wait. Six hours later in real time, you've got a 90% chance to encounter a Pokemon on that tree, with the encounter expiring 24 hours after you put the honey on it. And that's all there is to it. A very simple premise for another unique way to grab some new Pokemon and interact with this world. But like many other mechanics in Pokemon, looks are deceiving of the actual complexity. So let's take a closer look. First and foremost, the honey trees are real time in the real way. This means you cannot skip the 6 hours by messing with your game or system's clock. It is a hard locked, required amount of time for each encounter. In addition to this, the Pokemon you encounter is determined when the honey is placed, so the industrious trainer cannot re-roll the 6 hours for a better encounter. You can re-roll for most of a Pokemon's stats, but not for the species, which is the important part here. And this element to it is the first extreme, glaring difficulty of the whole process. Some even going as far to describe it as a design oversight. Not by me, of course. It's definitely just something I've heard and not said several times. I'd say if anything, they went a little too hard on the realism here. Because this idea makes sense in the world, and it's a fun one. A Pokemon eventually showing up later to grab some food that's been left out for them, and then setting up shop for about a day to really enjoy it. And then the trainer checks the bait in a similar time frame. It's all modeled very well from a narrative perspective, but as a game that you play as a real-life person, this can be extremely unforgiving. Even when I was little and had practically all the time in the world, I was still constantly missing my trees. Even more so now as an adult when I decide to pick up Pearl or Platinum. You play at a different time of day than you did last time, something comes up and you can't get on your DS for a day, or you just want to take a break and come back to it later. If you really want to engage with the honey trees, they can feel like an Animal Crossing-esque chore that demands time of you that you might not have. But perhaps I'm getting ahead of myself. We haven't even discussed what Pokemon can be found in the honey trees. Maybe the trees are supposed to be supplementary to the other encounter methods in the games, and contain Pokemon that we can maybe ultimately find using other methods. And so the trees could just be considered another option, an extra option that you don't have to concern yourself with. Right? Yeah. I think we all know where this is going. Outside of the Wurmple family, which I know is a huge grab for all the big Wurmple fans out there, every Pokemon you can find in a honey tree cannot be obtained through any other method. This includes Combi, Fermi, Cherubi, Apom, Heracross, and of course, Munchlax. So if you want any of these Pokemon lines in these games, like I think these two are pretty excellent, 
then this will require you to use the trees. Of course, not counting any outside methods like transferring or trading. This goes to make this handful of Pokemon all pretty rare in the context of these games, because they've got this non-negotiable time factor attached to them. You whiff a tree entirely or just get a Wurmple, and that's another 6 hours before you can have another go with that majestic hair across. Getting really any of these Pokemon was a huge deal for me and my group of friends as kids because of that upfront time investment on top of the rarity of each specific Honey Tree Pokemon. So now let's zoom in on that component of all this. What dictates what Pokemon we get once the honey is actually on the tree? And most importantly, how do I get a Munchlax? Munchlax are only capable of spawning at Lucky Trees. Unbeknownst to the average player, there are actually two types of honey trees, and there's no visual difference between the two types. The majority of the trees out of the 21 present on the map will be regular trees, but four of them will be lucky, and you have to figure out which ones they are in order to secure your Munchlax. There's no way to identify a lucky tree at a glance. Your four trees are determined by using a combination of your player ID and your secret ID and it results in every save file having a different combination of four trees. So you can't just memorize their locations, you're going to have to find yours specifically. Easy to use calculators exist for this now, but the average player would have to experiment to determine which trees are lucky and which trees aren't. The only difference we can actually interact with between the two types are their encounter tables for Pokemon. But here we find another incredibly odd design choice. Instead of each tree having its own distinct encounter table, we get a set of two that both trees use. But the lucky trees pull from the better table 70% of the time, as opposed to the regular trees only 20% of the time. But both are still possible, and there's a decent bit of overlap between the two tables. So determining a tree's type purely by my own experimentation isn't something I could do with just one encounter because there's a chance I got lucky on the bad table, or the composite chance that I got unlucky on the good table. But then we also need to be careful about our methods, because if you immediately put honey in a tree after an encounter, it has a 90% chance to select from the same table as that most recent encounter, the other 10% just picking randomly. This aspect actually can be helpful in the experimentation, as you could maybe narrow some trees down quicker, but it's another under the hood mechanic that can severely burn the player who unknowingly gets stuck looping the worst encounter table. All in all, the only way forward here would be carefully going for a plethora of honey tree encounters and then taking notes over a very long period of time, and then maybe using a tiny bit of math to eventually narrow down which of my trees are lucky ones. But after that, we can only hope and pray we actually encounter the Munchlax. Because this is the part where we just roll the dice and hope we get lucky. But how lucky are we actually talking here? Because certainly Munchlax can't actually be that uncommon once you have the special trees nailed down. There's no sensical reason for them to go any further than that. Things are already difficult enough. And you would think. But that's just the cherry on top of this nonsense. At any of the four lucky trees, Munchlax is a 1% spawn, a single percent, with an unnegotiable 6 hour cost to check one of those encounters, and it only even procs on about a fifth of the possible trees. This is actual lunacy. I've got a 20-ish percent chance of getting the right tree, a 6 hour wait, and then an insulting 1% chance of actually getting the Munchlax if I was able to figure out that initial 20%. I know it doesn't exactly work this way statistically, but if I just threw honey on a random tree, we're in a ballpark of a tenth of a percent chance. And for those of you playing at home, you'll be right to imagine that we're reaching similar odds to getting a shiny, which is unbelievable for just a regular Pokemon. But I almost find this crueler in a way, because if I'm not using the calculator, I could possibly be banking on the wrong trees, and then I'd have a 0% chance. It's just downright nutso. Such low odds on something you have to experiment for, coupled with a forceful time requirement? I dare say even that it's outrageous! Not to mention that the player is given virtually none of this information by the game itself. Munchlax's Pokédex entry goes as far to state, Area Unknown. And the information given to you in-game is scarce. The information regarding the tree types and the encounter tables is found in the Platinum Guidebook, but that's the extent of the information you're going to get without going into the game's code. 
The gag here is that you get just enough information to know that it's out there and that you can look for it, but you get no guidance or advice on how to go through with that process. So the average player is wasting even greater amounts of time because they don't know how to look for the encounter. I've certainly never found one. In a very early stage idea for this video, I thought I might try and muscle through hunting one without using the calculator. See if I could model that experimental process. But I fear that the time requirement could have me working on it in vain for weeks, months, maybe even in the area of a year. It's just grueling work, even more so with any real life responsibilities. So I think I'll be okay with not having one. I do want it, but there's just not enough time in the day for me. Maybe someday way down the road. I'm not happy about it, but it is what it is. And I'm mostly to terms with that. So there's really just one question left here on the table. How in the world did Barry get one? Barry probably takes the cake for the most impatient Pokemon character in the entire series. It simply doesn't make any sense for him to have a Munchlax once you've gotten down everything it would take for you to get one. The name of the game is Patience, something Barry does not possess. The patience required to grind through this hunt would test the saintliest of sages. So frankly, it's infuriating that Barry has one. Similarly to his advice on becoming the ultimate Pokemon trainer, just don't get hit and hit every move, obviously, he embodies a hmm, couldn't be me type of attitude, and when paired with his constant rushing around, he's just a really annoying guy. Perhaps he's always sprinting everywhere because he just has to check on his honey trees, sprinting around the region looking for his all-time favorite Pokemon. It's kind of a silly explanation, but I really like it. Complaining aside though, I do think it was a really clever decision to pair him with Munchlax here for a few different reasons, and it works really well both for him as a character, but also for the idea they're propping up with Munchlax too. That sort of mythological aspect that Munchlax has as this extremely difficult to track down creature is only further emphasized by Barry showing up with one and then not having anything to say about it. Like I was saying way back at the beginning, Munchlax's identity becomes something much more than just a difficult Pokemon to catch, because it makes you feel a certain way. On paper it's just difficult, but now with Barry, it's personal. Especially seeing it for the first time, it emphasizes all those questions you have. How does he have one? How do I get one? Why did the Pokedex say Area Unknown? What does he know that I don't? I can't express enough how much more mystique this Pokemon had for me the first time I played these games because it's shown to you in this unique way, and now there's a piece of its identity I'll never be able to separate from Barry. It's almost like Munchlax picked him specifically just to get under my skin that much more. It works so well because the two characters create a feedback loop for each other. They prop up each other's strengths as obstacles for the player. Munchlax as this infuriating creature of myth, and then Barry is a worthy rival. Yeah, I'll say it, I think he's the best rival across Pokemon. And the thing that pushes him over the edge for me is this interaction. I can beat him in a fight all day long, but he's beaten me bad when it comes to this. I can mold and cry and say it isn't fair, but he caught a Munchlax, and I did not. Now of course, you very well could technically have a Munchlax by now with a lot of time or luck spent on the project, but to do it so effortlessly, not even remark on it like he's doing here, is this ultra bold statement that doesn't even require words to be powerful. He puts you down just by being here, and I consider this the highest possible behavior of a rival. He's achieved that which I never had the drive to achieve myself. It's incredible. Let's also consider what led him to getting one because it makes him all that much cooler. The previous encounter you have with Barry before he shows up on Spear Pillar is you bearing witness to him getting destroyed by Jupiter at Lake Acuity and he takes it really hard. He was sent here to protect the legendary Pokemon Uxie from Team Galactic, but he just wasn't strong enough to do that. Maybe it was all just a game to him before this, but now he understands the gravity of this situation. That Pokemon called Uxie. It was suffering. I'm going to get tougher. It's not about winning or losing. That's not good enough. I have to be stronger.
His bright and high-flying persona he's had before this has been completely dashed as he comes to grips with not being able to save the day when it was actually important. And so off he goes to get stronger, but in the real way this time. And what better way to model a character moment like this than to return from a training arc with the most difficult to find Pokemon in the region, ready to settle the score with Jupiter, and then fighting with the player instead of against them. He's really grown. There's a multi-dimensionality to him for me because of this. Some back and forth between him and the player that makes them feel more like legitimate competitors instead of a fake one-sided feud. And this is because of Munchlax. Munchlax is the cherry on top of that story. Munchlax makes Barry feel more legitimate as a rival, and then Barry makes Munchlax feel more infuriating. And so the cycle goes, round and around. And so while I definitely think they went way overboard with the difficulty on this hunt, I can appreciate that they at least baked that obstacle into a potent characterization for the childhood friend. But as far as Munchlax itself goes, we've got a Pokemon that's tough as nails to track down, looks great, I especially love that animated sprite in Platinum, and just feels special. I can only imagine the gratification I would feel someday if I was able to catch one by the books. Well, definitely not as satisfying, I still did get a Munchlax at the end of the day, because there were a couple of ways outside of Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum to get one into Gen 4 but nothing that's too standard or by the books. And since they're all really fun, I want us to close out here today by looking at those alternative methods. Let's circumvent the evil of the honey trees and still bring home our prized munchlax. It almost feels like there was some recognition of how impossible a task this was when Gen 4 first came out, because there's a very strong implication that the main way you should be getting one is by transferring up a Snorlax from Fire Red or Leaf Green using the new transfer tool at Pal Park. Snorlax is a story encounter in those games, and it's extremely popular, so it was pretty easy as long as you had the means to send it from GBA to DS. And even though it was kind of inefficient, I have a huge soft spot for transferring Pokemon with Pal Park because there was so much fanfare attached to it. You pop the DS game in the top slot, the GBA game in the bottom slot, pick 6 Pokemon from the GBA game to move up, and then you get sent on what they're calling a catching show in this little model zoo looking area as you catch back your Pokemon. This is unfortunately limited to 6 a day, so it's a little bit tough, but they made a very logistical process into a game that actually felt fun, so I rate it really highly. I'm further inclined to think that this is how you were supposed to get Munchlax, because this girl in the lobby will give you a Poketch app if you show her a Snorlax giving you further incentive to transfer one up. Now you have to breed for the Munchlax off of the Snorlax after that transfer, which does require an additional item, but everything's in the books once you make that initial transfer. Getting the egg is super easy. And then eventually we would have access to the options presented in Harkold and SoulSilver, these beautiful, wonderful games. Just like in the original Gold and Silver, Snorlax is a static encounter right outside of Vermilion City once you can wake it up with the Poke Gear. This probably being the easiest of all the methods to get the Snorlax family in Gen 4. It's a story encounter, so you can't really miss it. But if you're hankering for something a little more unique and perhaps reminisce of that original difficulty, you can also find Munchlax itself on a few of the Pokewalker routes. Ah, the Pokewalker. Such an incredible little accessory taking the Pokemon out of the game and into your real life hands with a pedometer you can take them for walks on. The Pokewalker allows you to walk with your Pokemon at various locations, usually thematic of some type or environment, with a mini game that allows you to fight and catch Pokemon that you can return to your game with you. Walking generates Watts, the main resource of the device, and if you turn in enough Watts when you return from your adventures, you can unlock additional routes with new and better Pokemon on them. And you're going to be doing that a lot, as Munchlax can be found on the final route, the Quiet Cave, which takes only a measly, just a paltry 100,000 watts to unlock. You earn 1 watt every 20 steps, so all you gotta do is head out with your Pokewalker for a quick... 2 million steps. That's child's play! That seems like a really normal amount! And that also means you're not spending watts on anything else? So if you're really engaging with the device, in reality it's probably a fair amount more than 2 million. 
Once you actually have the cave unlocked, you can grab Munchlax on any individual day you take 10,000 or more steps. Still pretty rare at this point, but you're gonna get one pretty quick as long as you've stockpiled enough watts. But this isn't the only place on the Pokewalker you can find Munchlax. In 2010, a mystery gift event ran for HeartGold and SoulSilver that would allow players to walk on the legendary Winner's Path route with a plethora of incredible Pokemon and items waiting to be found inside. In addition to a great selection of Pokemon, one of those being Munchlax, every Pokemon on this route comes with a move it's usually incapable of learning, and they're all really great. This was one of my favorite routes as a kid for that reason. I loved all the Pokemon, thought they were super fun, but getting a Bounce Magikarp was especially charming to me for some reason. Just think about it, that idea is incredible. The big ticket item once again though is Munchlax, and the ones found here are ultra special and unique. This is the only place where you can get a self-destruct Munchlax and ultimately Snorlax in Gen 4, and it was a huge deal for the family at the time. Snorlax was already threatening competitively, but self-destruct is such an incredible move for the strength Snorlax already has. It offers an extremely high damage option on top of the normal type stab given to Snorlax, Exclusively positioning it here lets the route live up to that name, Winner's Path. This is a Pokemon uniquely equipped for victory. But as the route was a timed mystery gift exclusive, there's no way to receive the distribution anymore. And you definitely don't want to look into using any DNS exploits that would allow you to access the downloads today. That would just be awful. They did a few Pokewalker mystery gifts over the course of HeartGold and SoulSilver. And I think they're uniquely positioned as some of the best timed exclusives in the entire series because you could keep walking on the routes after the event ended. Once you had a route downloaded, you could walk on it whenever you wanted. It was kind of like they gave you a spawner instead of a one-time access code like for Celebi or Mew. And that functionality really came into play here. Since self-destruct couldn't be transferred like an egg move, those looking for the optimal self-destruct Snorlax would need to catch a lot of Munchlax and therefore end up spending a lot of time on the route. But this time around, the Munchlax method is tons of fun, so it's a win-win all the way through. I see Winner's Path as the end of this epic tale Pokemon told us about Munchlax across the generation. It originally had this reputation for being an extremely difficult to catch creature of legend. And even though it eventually got a distribution that made it much easier to obtain, it was still a creature of legend thanks to the exclusive self-destruct. It went from being ultra rare to uniquely ultra powerful. And so there's this curvature to the way I felt about it as I grew with the games, but that original sense of legend, myth, and desire never got lost as things got easier. That incredible identity that Munchlax built up with its original implementation never really went away, and it stuck with me after all this time. I really don't think they've ever topped the original Honey Tree method in terms of difficulty. Munchlax and Snorlax definitely aren't hard to come across now, and even in the Gen 4 remakes you can easily find Munchlax in the Grand Underground in addition to the Honey Trees. But with perspective of the series as a whole, that core identity still remains. An unsuspecting Pokemon on the surface? But dig a little bit deeper and you find an infuriating task so difficult it's still talked about to this very day. A Pokemon that strictly reinforces the notion that your rival actually is one step ahead of you, and has you swearing an oath of vengeance against the world's most impatient child. This is all the Pokemon Munchlax, and its legacy is unyielding. And that's all I got for you folks. Thanks a load if you made it this far. Hope you enjoyed it. Were you ever able to catch a Munchlax in Diamond and Pearl? Think there might be something out there that's harder to catch? Or perhaps you have a suggestion for the next video topic? Whatever you thought, let me know down below. For now, I've got to go check my honey trees, but it's been fun, and I'll see you all next time. Droomish out.